Okay, hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Dr. Jill Live. Super excited as always, but my guest today is uh, really, really special. You are in for a treat. Um, you're going to hear about some things that you maybe never knew existed and how powerful they are in healing the brain. First, I want to introduce my guest, Dr. Deborah Zielinski. Um, I will tell you a little bit about how I met her in just a minute. She's an optometrist noted worldwide for her work on neuro optometric rehabilitation. Sorry, I can't say this. Neuro optometric rehabilitation. Currently, she serves as founder and executive research director of the Mind Eye Institute based in Northbrook, Illinois, not too far where I grew up from. Her global reputation is due in part to her discovery of the use of eyeglasses to alter sound location and subsequent development of the Z-Bell test, the patented test that allows her to her and her team to prescribe lenses and use other optom optometric interventions that balance and process central and peripheral eyesight while synchronizing the integration between the auditory and retinal sensory systems. You're going to hear all about this. Um, we've talked before and we talked a little bit about, I want you to share a little video shortly about just your background, some of your patients' testimonies and stuff. And I think that'll do more for your bio and who you are than anything I have to say. But I first want to just frame this a uh, good friend and colleague that we both know, Dr. I, I won't mention the name, who referred me to you. And it was interesting because I don't have autism and I don't have, um, I have never been diagnosed with ADD. But in my experience, after I had a mold related illness, I was writing a book and I'm the book's coming out in March now. So you have something to do with this because all of a sudden I was having a lot more trouble focusing and concentrating when I was on screens and writing my book and I could do it, but it just took a lot longer. And so I went to see you this year. I'm wearing the glasses that you got for me. And what and I noticed that first month back from your clinic, wearing these glasses, it was like my old self. I was able to focus and concentrate. And again, you know why you're going to tell us about some of those pathways, but you're using these um, inputs into the brain basically to change brain function. And you work with brain brain injuries, you work with autism, you work with ADD, and you're going to share a little bit about that. But let's have you share your slides and first just share a video. You did this recently um, about your clinic, what you're doing, some of the cutting edge stuff. Oh, thank you, Jill. The uh, yeah, This is a video that I had put together because I won an award for innovation and it was right when COVID hit and they canceled the entire award dinner. And so we had to put in pre pre done videos. So uh, let me share my screen Perfect. and share the sound. Share the screen. Oops. Beautiful. Ah, uh, here you go. And then make it large so we can see it up full. And okay. Perfect. Oops. Is that okay? Can you see it there? Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. My name is Deborah Zielinski. I'm an optometrist who began my career in the 1980s as a director of a low vision clinic in Florida. Today, I serve as the founder and research director of the Mind Eye Institute, a practice which began in my own home in 1992 as the Mind Eye Connection and grew internationally, drawing patients from nearly every continent of the world. I had a, a brutal, serious headache for over a year. I've had multiple concussions, three of them within the last year and a half. My vocabulary went down to that, probably about a third grade level. My friendships were slipping. I couldn't, I couldn't maintain them. I couldn't communicate very well. Eye sensitivity, I couldn't drive at night. My emotions were gone. I couldn't add, subtract, divide, multiply. My quality of life after the accident went down to, um, well, no quality at all. I started almost speaking backwards. And it was like, I was always playing catch up when somebody was speaking to me. She puts the whole package together. I feel like Dr. Z has been put in my path and she's my personal miracle and she saved my life. Health issues, autism, brain injury, dyslexia. Um, I mean, there's, there's so many different facets that what she's doing is unbelievable. The biggest thing that Dr. Zielinski does is push the limits of science. Uh, she takes what she knows and what she understands about the brain, about the eye, theorizes what, what possibility could be there um, evaluates all of her patients individually and then combines all of that knowledge together to assess what she thinks the underlying problem is. I walked out with the biggest smile on my face and Deborah Zielinski gave me my life back. Basically, optometry is a really fun profession. I'm hoping that the rest of my career can be used to mentor other people as optometry continues to evolve. Thank you so much for this nice award. 
Thank you for sharing, Dr. Zelensky. First of all, I love that. I love in the end there, like that takes a whole, whole lot of talent to talk and to record and to be juggling. Uh, so amazing, amazing. Um, you've mentioned a little bit about this starting out of your house. What first like got you into, we're going to dive into what you do and you've got some slides to share there too, but how did you get into this and how did you start to discover that our peripheral retina has a lot to do with the brain and the inputs and can actually change how we behave and how we see the world? Um, well, I was always good at math. And uh, when somebody asked me, you know, what was I going to do with my life? What was I interested in? I told them I liked puzzles. I liked math. I liked people. I liked, I was interested in blindness. And they said, why don't you become an eye doctor? And I checked out ophthalmology and I checked out optometry and ophthalmology were surgeons that were up at six in the morning in hospitals, looking at bloody eyeballs and, you know, injecting people with things and doing surgery and optometrists were doing math puzzles all day long. And you didn't have to wake up at six in the morning to do it. So um, I chose optometry uh, as a career because I wanted to be with people, but yet use the math skills that I had. Um, Amazing. And, and I, I've seen it because I've been to your clinic. And, and I just want to say for those listening who don't know you, you really are a genius in your field. I'm sure you've been told that by more people than just me, but it taking that skill of really the calculations and all that it takes to do what you do. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to share a little bit more of your slides, you can kind of talk us through kind of the way that um, you evaluate a patient and you look at this. And because I think the more people understand, it starts to make sense. Like for me, it made so much sense Oh, of course, that we have inputs into the brain through the eye, right? Okay. Well, you asked me earlier about how I thought about the peripheral retina having so much to do. Uh, I watched a doctor who was another optometrist named John Thomas. And he, this was years and years, 40 years ago, when overhead projectors were around. And he had a, a slide sheet that he would put on the projector and show there are signals going straight through into your eyes. And that's what you see with and then he would take the slide off and put another slide on the projector and say, but there's these other pieces connected to the eye that go up and down for motor movement. And then he would take that sheet off and go back and forth. He went back and forth to the two sheets. So I remember going back home after this lecture and saying to my aunt, who was a medical illustrator, isn't there a way to draw lines going sideways and lines going up and down in the same picture because this guy spent a half an hour flipping back and forth. So she said, well, sure, you can draw it. So she drew for me lines coming into the eyesight and up to go down for the, the yeah. that would uh, go up and down for the spinal cord re reactions. And from there, I created a really neat picture and started uh, reading neurological books and then expanded on that what's actually happening in the eyes. And then in 20 years later, in 2007, uh, I wrote a chapter for a textbook, or not a textbook, for, um, for a book on uh, all these connections. And it, basically all my research started from there. Wow. And what it was is your curious mind was like, what if this, you know, what you, you were asking questions, which I think is what drives all of us that discover things and discover new ways of doing things. Mm -hmm. You really pioneered this though. And especially um, the way that you assess patients, tell us just a little bit about the bells, the, the infamous bells and, and sound and how you mm -hmm. actually assess a patient for what they might need with their um, lenses. Well, sure. Um, in 1992, I was playing with a friend of mine that I've known since kindergarten. She was telling me how her ears were so good and her hearing was great. And, um, you know, as we got older, if her eyesight would get worse, she still had her ears to fall back on because she has diabetes and she was worried about, you know, when she was older, she might lose some of her eyesight, but her career was based on auditory. So I said, prove how good your ears are. And I, I had something that I'd made a sound with and had her close her eyes and try to find it. She found it easily. And then I had these weird prism goggles sitting around because I was an optometrist. And I thought to myself, I'm going to just play a joke on her. I'm going to put these weird goggles in front of her and it's going to make her see things in a really weird place and she'll reach wrong and I can laugh at her. But she misunderstood me. So she closed her eyes a second time because she had closed them the first time. Yeah. So I, I was ringing the sound and she had her eyes closed. And I remember seeing that and thinking, well, the glasses won't do anything when her eyes are closed, but I'm lazy. I'll just do it and I'll redo it in a, in a minute with her eyes open. So when I had the glasses in front of her closed eyelids, she couldn't find the sound. 
And the way she thought the sound moved was the same way the glasses had pushed the light. So then I turned the glasses upside down in all different directions. And I made her hear the sound to the left, to the right, higher, lower, farther, closer, depending on what I put in front of her closed eyelid. So that's what started the Z-Bell testing. Wow. And, and again, but at that time, in the early 90s, there wasn't any particular literature that showed ears and eyes were connected to each other. But it kept working on all my patients. And this is I why I, to, Go ahead. I went to different physicians and said, hey, you know, these glasses are changing auditory function. And people were telling me there's no connection. You know, you're crazy. It's a fluke. And it's like, but it can't be a fluke. It's on everybody. And so you were going to say something? I was going to say, it's amazing because you're describing your discovery of what you're doing, right? Like, and it's, it's so amazing yeah. how that kind of, it, it was almost accidental, but again, yeah. you observed and you're like, oh, this is interesting. And again, I've done that in a whole different realm. You make observations, yeah. scientists always, right? We make observations yeah. first and then we're like, what if there was something to this? And again, now you've developed a whole science of really helping people. And that's one of the ways you test still today, right? As they put in prisms and absolutely. Health. Yeah, because, but, but today there's science that backs me up totally. And, uh, but that's what, when I started there and I was going to all these optometrists and ophthalmologists and people and saying, hey, and they're like, there's no research showing this. So then I went to neuroscience conventions because neuroscientists did exactly what you just described, Jill, where they said, you know, what about this? What happens if this? They're, they ask a question and then figure out an answer. And I went to Europe in 2000 and taught a bunch of optometrists in other countries. And the, um, we ended up creating a certification program for just the bell part. And then now what we have at the Mind Eye Institute is a, is a five level, level certification type thing. So we're, we're having in-house optometrists that have five different levels, not just the one level of bell testing. Wow. And um, it's, it's, it just kept ballooning because the, there's more and more research now proving and demonstrating that the ears and eyes are connected and they keep finding new things that the retina is doing and which I show on the slides when, when we're ready. Yes, let's go there next. But I wanted to say this makes so much sense again, because I know that the gut affects the heart and the it's everything's connected, right? Things that we never used mm -hmm. to put together. Um, and it's no surprise that you can use the ears and the sound and the eyes and all of this to diagnose those pathways. Um, tell us real quickly, and maybe you want to go into the slides because it might be there, but there's we talk, we think about vision as our 2020, like our central vision versus this mm -hmm. periphery, because you're actually changing more of the peripheral. What's the difference between central and peripheral? vision and why, or why would one affect the brain more than the other or maybe well the per the peripheral eyesight is designed to keep you safe and you know be aware of what's going on but it's beneath the conscious level and you also use it to navigate so if you're walking in a room and let's say like like, like the old dick van dyke show there's a footstool in the way your peripheral eyesight is what keeps you from tripping over it you'll see it out of the corner of your eye and then walk around it um, the peripheral eyesight judges space and how far away you are from things. Uh, it, 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 it does a lot. Um, it runs beneath the conscious level the same way that like swallowing would. Mm -hmm. If you have a sore throat, you're aware of every single time you swallow. If you don't have a sore throat, you, can, you don't have any idea how many times you swallow during a day. Uh, so it's, it's peripheral eyesight is turned on all the time, but it's muted where it's just enough to keep you comfortable. So if you're in a safe environment, your peripheral eyesight is pretty much dormant. But if you're in an uncomfortable environment, the peripheral eyesight is on to protect you from sudden movements or scary things. Uh, so the peripheral eyesight turns on and off and it's faster. The signals from it are faster than the central eyesight signals. So the 2020 is what was designed you know, 160 years ago to standardize eye exams. But nowadays with computer screens and scrolling and you know, shifting gears and, and internet surfing, we use our eyes in a completely different way than they did in the 1860s, which was, you know, the testing was for stationary targets. So I want to use myself an example and ask you a few questions because I think this is relevant. Obviously, you've got me these glasses. They've been super helpful. Both of my filters are on the left eye. And mm -hmm. in hindsight, after I saw you got home and I realized I could focus better, two questions, and I'd love for you to tell me maybe why this would be. 
I would always have more trouble on screens than reading paper. So that was one interesting thing. I preferred paper. But probably the more interesting with this left side is it depending on the side of the car I was in. If I was driver, I felt much more comfortable. I didn't get headaches. I didn't, I could have a conversation with someone to my right because there's no uh -huh. filters here. But if I was on the left on the passenger side, I would get more nauseous, more dizzy. I didn't like looking at that person. Mm -hmm. Would that explain these filters on this side and how my brain affected the inputs from both sides? No, uh, it wouldn't, but it would, it would it would affect the hemispheres of your brain. So if somebody were on your left as a driver and you were a passenger, yeah. it meant that your right hemisphere had more activity in it. Got and it. if they were on your left and you were the driver, then it means your left hemisphere would have more brain activity. So it really would depend on who you are as a person. Like I'm a very right brain person. Uh, so if I had damage to my left brain hemisphere, it wouldn't affect me as much as somebody who was very left brained. Interesting. Uh, so it, but the filters don't have that. The filters are blocking off some of the peripheral activity. Okay. And it's just making okay. the inputs more balanced. So you technically could maybe make someone more creative if you block their left brain. <laughs> Technically, <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, let's go on your slides because you do such a good job of explaining what, what you do with those and you can just share those and uh, whenever you're ready. Okay, all right, here we go. Perfect. Let's see. My name is Deborah Zielinski. I'm a okay, so here is the, the retina. This is a book and it's called the retina, an approachable part of the brain. The retina is actually the lining of your eye, and it's it's a part of your brain. It's made out of brain tissue, so people don't realize that, and they don't realize that all the body systems connect with the eyes. So, like you were saying, the gut and the eyes connect, and the gut and the heart connect. Uh, everything's all connected. Mm -hmm. There's a Marcus Welby episode from 1969, the year that the neuroscience. Uh, uh, Foundation, the Society for Neuroscience was founded. And the Marcus Welby episode has a, a person coming to Marcus Welby, the doctor, saying, Thank you, Dr. Welby, for telling me to get new glasses. Because you, you know, he told them, he says, Ever since I got my new glasses, my digestion has been so good. So somebody in 1969 knew wow. that new glasses would affect digestion in the gut. But here we were, you know, 50 years later, and nobody, the eye care professionals don't really know that. Yeah, so true. So, so this is what I was telling you earlier, mm -hmm. that it, the chart that everybody's used to was invented 160 years ago. And the instrument that's used to block off your eyesight was invented 120 years ago. And uh, nowadays, let me put this down here, the newer inventions in 2021 are very sleek looking and computerized, but they're doing the same thing the 1904 invention was, which is holding all these lenses and blocking off the peripheral eyesight. So the big key is in all of these testing, you're testing central eyesight. And according to Patrick Quaid in Canada, um, the central eyesight, when you get an eye test on a stationary target, it's only targeting 6% of what you're looking at your peripheral eyesight has all this 94% of your environment is pouring in, but not that 6%. The 6% is your central eyesight and it comes after you aim and focus on a target. The 94% comes in at a subconscious level where you're not paying attention to it. And what you're seeing is that 94% is affecting every system, right? So if you can alter how that comes in, it might change someone's ability to think or talk or walk or whatever other uh, input. Is that correct? Yes. I, yes, it is. It changes. So our prescriptions at the Mind Eye Institute are governed around this 94% because there's faster processing than the 2020 concept. So we have a lot of people with symptoms uh, from head injuries or, or just learning problems. And they, they come in seeing 2020 or sometimes better than 2020, but we might make them a little less than 2020 they get more comfortable. So people have a choice of, you know, do you want to see the speck that's way down on the bottom and have headaches every day or be one line up so you can see something a quarter of an inch tall, 20 feet away, but not, you know, a, a, but not an eighth of an inch tall and uh, all your symptoms will go away. So it's, it's that 2020 was designed to standardize eye care 
but it wasn't designed for people with head injuries or biochemical dysfunctions or you know, autonomic dysfunctions or autism. There's so many things that affect brain activity. I mean, in the 1800s, not very many people were on medications. And now a lot of patients come in on a lot of different medications. Those are affecting their processing also. So the medications affect brain processing from the inside and the eyeglasses affect brain processing from the outside. And sometimes they can have a com complementary effect. Mm, amazing. So, so that's the people have to realize that this 2020 is, you know, 2020 means you see at 20 feet what the average person sees at 20 feet. So half the population is worse and half the population is better, but that's still only testing attention on a non-moving high contrast target. And it usually tests one eye and then the other eye separately. But then they say, here's your glasses. Now go out and walk around and see moving targets with cluttered backgrounds. And that's not assessed in regular testing. So the general population is fine with this kind of test. It's, you know, it's been around 160 years, yeah. it works. But our practice at Mind Eye Institute takes people with brains that aren't quite working properly. And then those people need extra testing. And that's what we provide is the extra testing. So we look at the peripheral eyesight in terms of either it's always on or it's always off. And if you live where it's always turned on and there's a floodlight, then those people are labeled ADD. And if you live on the other end where you just have this pen light and you turn off the periphery and you live in your own little world, those people are labeled as having autism and there's a spectrum. So what the average person should do is be in the middle somewhere and sometimes turn the floodlight on and sometimes turn the pen light on. So for instance, once I dropped an earring in a hotel room and I had to find the earring, I had to turn the floodlight on and my eyes were used in a completely different way than when I'm proofreading something for a commas and colons and periods and type font, mm -hmm. then I turn the pen light on. So you, you have to go both ways. Um, what we really want is flexibility, right? Because if the inflexibility is where you get stuck and you have disorders, mm -hmm. and so you're creating yep. more flexibility in that range, right? Absolutely. It, it, we, we call it the four A's. It, it, here it says attention and awareness. That's on the outside. And then adaptability, like you're saying, flexibility, adaptability and attitude are on the inside. The patients with a great attitude like yours do really well. And the patients with the victim attitude of nothing's going to help me. I can't see. It's horrible. You know, I don't want to work so hard. Right. They're not going to get better. And we have eyesight the 2020 is at a very long end of a chain of reactions. So that 2020 comes after the unconscious sensory integration of your eyes and your ears and subconscious processing and then conscious processing. That 2020 is a culmination of you pointing your eyes, looking at a target, determining what you're looking at, figuring out what it is, relating it you know, to what you know, and then saying what letters you see. So there's so much that happens before that, that you have this image forming eyesight, the central eyesight to see details and peripheral eyesight to be aware of a background. And you have non-image forming, non-eyesight signals, which link with many, many other things. Now, this is what I had my aunt draw way back in 1990. She actually drew this wow. in 1992, but then we modified it in 1996 but the signals going straight in for eyesight and up and down for motor systems and other. And at that time, it was only known that posture, but since that time, there keeps being discoveries on retinal processing and what the retina is connected to. Amazing. And so obviously you have as the brain injury, autism, any sort of spectrum. And like I said, even though you're not the mold expert, if people have issues from a chemical toxin or something, again, you can probably see changes that would help them. But do you also motor like stroke or, or those things? Do you see changes with the motor as well? Because you're showing me those pathways. I'm assuming there can Absolutely. be. Yeah, there, there are. Yeah. We, we work with stroke victims pretty often. Mm -hmm. Um, but because there's there's links between endocrine functions, autonomic functions, limbic functions, and the stroke patients would have problems of knowing where their legs are, where their head is, in head position, judging spatial relationships, processing with memory time. It's all connected. And the interesting thing is these non-image forming, there's these types of things. 
And then eventually when those are comfortable and you feel safe, do I care? If you don't care about something, why are you going to put effort and energy into aiming and focusing on a detail? So you'll get people who've been to practitioners and they're told they can't aim their eyes. Well, they can't aim their eyes because they don't care about what you're handing them. You're saying, look at a pencil and watch it come toward your nose. I don't care about the pencil. It hurts. It's too much effort. I don't want to. So mm -hmm. it's... There's a lot of things going on at one time. And after all this is put together, then you have a final motor decision of what should I do about it? Do I reach? Do I point my eyes? Do I move? You know, what do I do? So this is kind of what Mind Eye is doing. <clears throat> the Mind Eye Institute looks at all of those things, including uh, who am I? Because your personality traits make a difference also. And then space and time judgments and then determining what an object is and what to do about it. It looks at the immune functions, the body survival, and this is the diff there's five different certification levels. So when you're talking about the bell, that's just one aspect of awareness of space through an auditory sense. What other kinds of testing are you doing um, in the office to determine? I mean, I've seen it, so I know it, but what would be like a visit look like for a patient? Uh, we, we do a lot of testing. We're, mm -hmm. we're looking at uh, visual perceptual skills and uh, such as uh, being able to pull a figure out of clutter, being able to rotate a figure and know, you know how it would look rotated, um, seeing details and being aware of differences, comparisons and contrasting, um, being able to see parts of a relationship and link parts to whole um, many different perceptual skills. We're also looking at conversion of words into pictures, pictures into words, uh, judgment of space, basically how you control your environment. You know, some people control their environment and other people let the environment control them. Now, quick question again, maybe have the answer, maybe don't, but I'm assuming a lot of IQ is visual perception. There's a lot of things to do with visual perception that affect our ability to think and process and solve problems. And do you think that um, the if we had better, like if we did what someone came to see you at Mind Eye and they had mm -hmm. the glasses and they changed the peripheral inputs, could it change IQ? Do you think it uh, could? It has. I mean, we've had patients that have a 30 point shifts. We've had people with 90s that have gone up to 120. Wow. Because uh, I've had that once with a girl and then we've had many that were, you know, 15, 20 point differences. So that's a full standard deviation. Um, so yes, because yeah. the, intelligence uh, they say intelligence and visualization are connected there the better you can visualize the more intelligent you are well that makes so much sense that and that's part of that creativity too so i'm assuming that would all connect um i want to share about the award and kind of the future of optometry which with your video but before we do you had lots of stories in the first video you shared of people who had success what are, do you have one or two story, like stories or incidents where you really saw this? I mean, you see this every day. You get to see miracles every day, but do you want to share with us like one or two patient stories just very generally about how the glasses impacted their lives? Oh, we have so many. I know, um, right? <laughs> Sorry. Trying, I mean, the most fun for me are to watch little children. Um, so I had a child once, I was doing a screening and at a school and she had her eyes closed. She was trying to reach for the bell and I was putting different things in front of her eyes and she couldn't do it. And I remember her looking at me and she goes, that's so hard. Can anybody do that? Mm -hmm. and, and it was like, then I put a particular color in front of her that filtered out some light and she was boom, 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 touching the bell easily. And she you should have seen the, the smile on her oh. face go from <laughs> ear to ear. And she just said, wow, these glasses make me so smart. And those types of things are just heartwarming yeah. to see. I mean, we, we, we do see that type of stuff every day, but when you hear it out of a, a young child, it's, it's just natural. Oh, I love and, you're that. and we had another little boy who was going to be given uh, special ed classes and they had come here uh, on a weekend and we did something with them. Uh, and then when he went back to school, you know, like this, he was, um, like toward Thanksgiving vacation, then they had Christmas break. So between November, he was not reading at a kindergarten level. Mm -hmm. And then he went back to school like after Christmas holidays and he was reading at above a second grade level. Like he jumped up like three years of, of work within a month period and everybody was, what happened to him? 
And it was while I connected his eyes and his ears and all of a sudden reading just made sense. And he went into the gifted class. So his entire trajectory of life changed because he would have been down the special ed path, but you know, with an intervention, he went through a gifted path. How amazing that you can really like turn on parts of the brain that maybe weren't functioning before through the retina. It, this is just yeah. fascinating to me and, and kudos to you. Um, share with us now, we talked at the beginning about this and I can't wait to share with people. The White House has taken notice and they also mm -hmm. want to start with some screenings. I don't know if you want to share mm -hmm. the video and then talk a little bit about what's happening or talk first, but either way, tell me a little bit about what's the future here and what, what recognition this work is getting. Well, I'm, I'm actually, I've been working with the Society for Brain Mapping Therapeutics uh, for many years now, for probably 12 years, 13 years. Uh, and it's the them the Society for Brain Mapping Therapeutics, who is being led by a Dr. Babak Kateb. And he has been lobbying with the White House for 13 years now. And after that, they have finally taken notice. And I was invited with him and four other people to represent the central nervous system. So since the retina is a piece of your central nervous system, that's my part. And then we went with a... Um, a brain surgeon who works on brain tumors, who went with a spinal cord surgeon who works on spinal injuries, um, and a psychiatrist who works on mental health problems, all of which are on the rise. Yeah. And the White House was really interested in this there, to create a brain center because the current way at NIH, they don't have the interaction between things. Like I went to the NIH saying, you know, can I do some research? And they said, okay, you're an eye doctor, go to an eye, do eye doctor, the, and the National Eye Institute. The Eye Institute said, no, you're working with sounds. You need to go to the ear place. Oh, I went to the sound, the deaf and communication center. And they said, no, you're working with brain function, go to the brain place. And the brain said, no, you're an eye doctor. So it was, I was given the runaround. Whereas the Society for Brain Mapping and Therapeutics is putting everything together under one umbrella where there's integration amongst people. So the White House is interested in it. And I was going to say it's so parallel to functional medicine because we're rheumatologists, gastroenterologists, you know, like in, in functional medicine, we're root cause and we're looking at all these together. You're doing the parallel thing there. And this is really mm -hmm. in our complex world, when we need complex answers, we have to be integrating just like what you're saying. I didn't mean to yeah. interrupt you, but I want to share that that's so important on all levels for the medicine that we need to be doing because mm -hmm. um, we're not thinking about systems versus just one silo. It's not going to get solutions. But that's what this is. I agree with you. It's it's all systems and the brain is processing everything concurrently, but at different speeds. So they say it's independently yet interdependently. Right. And it's so I was lucky enough to go to the White House and they liked what we had to say. Now we're going to be going to the Pentagon in December. And then in uh, February, we have the, uh, the, the Brain Mapping and Therapeutics uh, Annual Convention, and I'm going to be inducted as their president. So I have one year to take my vision of of optometry and create the future of optometry amongst scientists that have a, that are like-minded. Wow. And the, the legacy that I want to have is for people to realize that eyeglasses are not just to make you see, they're to make your brain function differently. And the way I see the long distance future is eventually people will be coming to optometrists to you know, regulate blood sugar and regulate thyroid function and regulate heart rate and all kinds of things. You know, that's not there yet, but the connections are there. And there's so many patients that have these like offshoots and side effects where they come back and say, my thyroid's normal now. Yeah. And, and nobody, none of the optometrists, including myself, yet have done enough research to know what's happening. But wow. they just found a year ago, a new retinal cell and nobody knows what it's for. It runs the complete thickness of the retina. It's too tiny to have been seen by microscopes. They could only see it on a nanoscope and nobody knows what it's there for. So it's gotta be something. So you know, the next 40 years of my it. research. Yes, yeah. exactly. Oh, and what a great uh, position for you to have. Um, you just have my word. If there's any way I can support you, <laughs> I love the work you're doing. Um, share with us a video about the, that you were going to um, show us. Or okay. just, love sure. It. This is new. Let's see. Okay. Let's see. How do I? Your next visit to the doctor could include screenings of your physical and your mental health. The screening would look for signs of anxiety or depression before referring you to next steps with a specialist. KCR3's Amy Liu live in our Washington newsroom now, and the screenings would be for both adults and kids, Amy. 
That's exactly right, Deirdre. A new guidance recommends anxiety and depression screenings for kids. And right now, doctors are considering expanding that for adults as well in response to a rising need in mental health care. Most preventive services will occur um, in the primary care setting. So I think it's hugely important um, to have that established trust. As a physician and researcher, Dr. Benga Ogadegbe wants to look beyond just blood pressure and vital signs during your appointment. For the first time, he and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force are considering checking mental health as well. The COVID pandemic actually has taken a toll on the mental health of the population, particularly among children and adults. Doctors say screenings could help identify more cases of anxiety and depression in some kids and adults who may not have noticeable okay. symptoms. Mental health was always seen as, oh, it's something I have to be scared about. And they now realize it's not, it's treatable. The screenings are based on a mix of written questions and others asked by your doctor. Your answers could lead to a specialist referral, diagnosis, and treatment. Anxiety is just another illness, just like if you have high blood pressure, get help, get it diagnosed and get help. And while the screenings for kids 8 to 18 is final, doctors right now are going to start reviewing feedback today on whether to expand that guidance for adults up to the age of 65. Deirdre. So what else do they actually look for when they're, they're doing these screenings for mental health? Well, the guidance actually mentions screening for suicidal risk, which doctors say is a leading cause of death for adults as well as kids. But right now, there just isn't enough research on whether actually screening for uh, people who do not present any signs or symptoms actually prevents suicide. So right now, the task force is suggesting that there's more research. There needs to be more research on this topic. And they're suggesting to doctors to use their best judgment on a case-by-case -case basis. Dear John. All right. Thank you, Amy. Appreciate it. Yeah. And then so, you had a study. I want you to share that oh, too. Oh, yeah, okay. Like I want the Sorry. two important things. Yeah, because no, that's really because I think that's where this is going is just the study on your next there we go. visit to the doctor Oops. could include screening. Your next visit there, this there one. Go. So what we had done, and this is back. This is published in the Journal of Alzheimer's Disease in 2022. So it's brand new, and we proposed already a brain, spine, and mental health screening for healthcare systems. Mm -hmm. And this is through the Society for Brain Mapping Therapeutics. You can find it under worldbrainmapping.org. Mm -hmm. And I'm one of the many authors. Um, the person here above me, Aaron Filler, is the one of the people who invented the DTI machines to analyze brain function. So there's a lot of offers. Deepak Chopra is uh, dealing with things uh, of uh, meditation. Oops, sorry. Get out of this here. But the, the mental health screening that we're proposing, this is part of what the White House is wanting to uh, back because mental health issues, especially after COVID, is, are on the rise. Um, brain tumors are on the rise. Uh, just opioid addictions are on the rise. There's so many things. And then the veterans need things. Those are uh, President Biden's four main issues. And so our, our organization is trying to work with that. I love that because you bring such a unique and, and really holistic solution because, and it's not related, not that we don't have drugs for a purpose, no problem with that, but how cool would it be if we can change the brain through the eyeglasses, which we know is true. Um, mm -hmm. Love that you're going to be on the president of the Brain Mapping Society and mm -hmm. can't wait to hear, we're going to have to have you back next year so you can tell us what all happened in the year. Um, any last bits of wisdom? If someone, first of all, where can people find you? Let's start there. I think you have oh, the website. Right. In my mindeye.com. Perfect. Perfect. And you're in Chicago, uh, in the suburbs, right? I went yeah. to be perfect. Um, and you're training doctors too. So I know you have a colleague and do, are you planning to have more, um, doctors there in your clinic or optometrists? We are, we're expanding. We'll be building two extra examination rooms. And we, uh, we have one optometrist who just started about a month ago and we're looking for a second optometrist now uh, to have the next, the other new exam room. And then currently Dr. Adams and I are the two main optometrists here. So we'll have four optometrists soon and uh, we're hoping to keep growing and going worldwide. Eventually we'd like to have mind eye clinics everywhere.
Oh, I would love to hear that. It's amazing. Thank you for your groundbreaking and brilliant work, Dr. Zielinski. We owe so much to you. And I, I can't wait to see what the next several years hold as we, you train more doctors and more people to do this. Um, and thanks for your time today. I am incredibly grateful. Thank you so much, Joe.